you ready? All right. Hi there, I'm Nora Dunn, and I'm otherwise known as the Professional Hobo. And welcome to my series where I speak with ordinary people who have extraordinary travel lifestyles, remote careers, and adventures to share. Now, before I introduce my guest today, I encourage you to check out the description for a link for your free checklist of 10 crucial things you must do before you travel long term. Also, I always appreciate a thumbs up and leave a comment. Let me know how you're liking this series. Now, my guest today is Life Pedersen. He's a freelance writer, author, humorist, world traveler, and award-winning travel and tourism marketing professional. He's traveled through 57 countries, and he's lived in Spain, Romania, and Italy. His latest book, Throwing Up, Notes from 35 Years of Juggling, is available on Amazon, along with his travel memoir, Backpacking with Dracula. Pedersen was a silver medalist at the 2014 International Jugglers Association Championships. He loves chocolate. He hates pickles. I have a problem with that. He types with exactly four fingers and can escape from a straitjacket. I can attest to that. <laughs> He's not vomited since 1993, thus making him a consummate travel journalist and an excellent party guest. Well, I have to say that's probably one of the more interesting bios I've read out. <laughs> Welcome, <laughs> life. Hi. Now, in my online stalking of you, I have detected uh, a couple of themes that you and I share, one of which is a theme that in a variety of different ways, you and I have been ahead of our time. So I wanna tackle this theme chronologically, and I'm gonna start at the beginning. And the beginning happened many years ago, a couple of decades ago, actually, when you filmed the pilot for a TV show that flopped. But had you done it 10 years later, you'd be a star today. And you ended up writing an ebook about it. I read it. It's great. It's a short, fun read. Why don't you tell me about this experience? So, uh, yeah, in 1993, I was still a fresh faced college student and I was studying abroad in London uh, to complete my completely useful um, theater and literature uh, <laughs> program and degree. Uh, and while I was in London at a karaoke night at my local pub, a stranger accosted me. We talked for a while and it um, developed rapidly into a job offer for me to be the camera guy for an on-location cooking show idea that he had. Um, and they were going to shoot the pilot in Morocco, leaving in, a, in about two months. Um, and would I be interested? And uh, I was, it was early in my travel career. I was still pretty fresh faced and, and naive, but uh, I definitely had the sense of adventure and it was just irresistible. So I said, yes, my parents, of course, kind of lost their minds, but it was all fine. And uh, yeah, so I wasn't in front of the camera. I don't know if I would have been a star. I would have been a much better cameraman if it, the show had been picked up, but uh, that's a skill set that I've lost now too. Um, so yeah, we spent Swedes in Morocco filming the pilots uh, and uh, European broadcasters across the board were not interested. And uh, that was, uh, I mean, obviously there's a lot of details in there, but uh, that was it until uh, 2003 when I caught No Reservations uh, when it started to air. And I was like, we already did that. And, but then, of course, it was Anthony Bourdain, and he, is a, he was a force, uh, personality-wise, and I'm sure that had a lot to do with it. But uh, yeah, we did the food, travel food show thing first. I just want that on the record. <laughs> well, it is officially on the record. You were the pioneer in the travel food show industry. Uh, unfortunately, you were ahead of your time. And did you enjoy the experience of traveling while filming a television show or filming a television show while abroad? And how did that did. perhaps change your experience? I hadn't been to any developing countries in that manner before. So Morocco was a sometimes painful learning experience just because, you know, it was a Muslim country. I had no familiarity with that whatsoever. You know, remember, this is 1993. There was no Internet. Uh, any knowledge that I had gleaned was, you know, through, you know, the news. So there was the culture shock, the unfamiliarity, the new experience of having a very close team traveling and working together. That was a, there was a bit of, um, there was a, 
group dynamic that developed over time that wasn't super awesome. Um, and I think that's pretty common now uh, in retrospect with people, a small group of people traveling and working together in each other's armpits 24 hours a day. So, I mean, that was expected. But at the time for me, I was like, oh, we are screwed. Um, and that I go into that in wretched detail in the book uh, about the personality conflicts. But yeah, I... Um, I think the whole experience being in Morocco, traveling, it was only six weeks, but for, for me, that was long-term travel at the time. Uh, and all of that together definitely had uh, impact and inspired me more than a decade later to leave my job, sell everything, and become a, a nomadic wanderer for four and a half years. And I accidentally on purpose became a travel writer during that period. That was an entirely different thing. I was on my own. I didn't really have a goal. I just kind of had like a romantic idea of what might happen, but wasn't married to it. Uh, I had plans to go back to my old job when the money ran out. It just so happens that I, I somehow managed to be successful despite having absolutely no experience. I still have yet to ever take a writing class. Um, I just made it happen. Uh, I think through the sheer power of nonstop travel and nonstop writing, when you do these types of things all day, every day, you obviously you're going to get better uh, rather quickly. And um, it was a time when uh, it was before travel blogging really took off. And so I was among, uh, we call it the bronze age of travel blogging. And uh, so I had a, a bit of a profile uh, right away and that also helped. And then uh, when I got into the Lonely Planet author pool, things just took off for me. My resume just kind of snowballed from there. This is another way in which you and I have this, this commonality of this theme of being a little bit ahead of our times. Because both you and I got into the travel blogging and travel writing space before it was the saturated industry that it is today. Uh, and I, I think that by by, by virtue of being early adopters, that afforded us the ability to get noticed uh, quickly. And, sure. you know, I don't have a writing degree either. I've always had a penchant for the written word, but I, like you, just figured it out as I went along. And also, let's get it right. There, it's not like there was an online course teaching you how to do this. Now, right. now you've got your pick of <laughs> ways to learn how to, you know, be a travel blogger and a travel writer. I think I Googled how to be a travel writer recently. It was something like 60 million search results. <laughs> <laughs> so, yes, in 2003, there was about four search results, and one of them was extremely helpful, but the rest of it, I just learned through trial and error. So what was your approach? How did you build your career and, and build a name for yourself at that time? Uh, I didn't have an approach. Uh, I was winging it uh, wholeheartedly. What I was doing was just publishing just the full brain dump of everything that I did, every thought I had, every activity. And the purpose was to keep my friends and family at home uh, apprised of my movements and adventures, but also I was going to use these exhaustive notes later on. This was, I did actually have a little bit of a plan. I was going to use these detailed, ridiculously detailed notes later to whittle down um, all of my adventures to shorter digestible stories that I could then pitch to travel outlets. So there, there was a bit of a, a strategy there, I guess, uh, to, um, after a while, but initially it was just me writing down my thoughts um, so that I had a record of it because uh, I have poor memory. Uh, even This was even true in my 20s, but I was 33 at the time when I started the, the travel blogging Bronze Age experiment. And uh, I just wanted it there for the record so that I could go back. If, if worse came to worse and I ended up back at my old job after the money ran out, at least I would have a detailed journal of what I did and I could go back and remind, oh yeah, that's that was super fun. Oh, I'd forgotten all about that. And before all my travels in my 20s, I'd written down almost nothing and it was just gone. So I wanted to avoid that. Well, and back in the Bronze Age, you call it the Bronze Age. I call it the Pioneer Days. Either way, back in the day, uh, that's what a travel blog was. It was really just a glorified online journal. So I, I would say I got my start the same way too. I was, I was really just uh, publishing my musings uh, and uh, what I was doing around the world as a way of staying in touch with family and friends. Uh, it, was, it was an alternative to the, to the prior strategy for any world traveler, which was to send a mass email. You, you got the email addresses of all your family and friends. You wrote these long missives. You sent them off in an email, uh, which more often than not, I think probably got deleted. So I, I wanted to cases, not, yep. exactly. I didn't want to be one of those people. So I thought I'm going to put it online. And that way, if someone wants to know what I'm doing, they can find it. Now, how did your, so you and I again started in this way, how did your travel blog start getting noticed? Was it the travel writing that brought 
views to your travel blog or the other way around? What happened? It was it was partially because I was one of a handful of what we've you know described as travel bloggers in the day, and so there were so few of us that it was not you know discovering us and finding us was you know a matter of minutes. You know now you have to dig through thousands and thousands of active blogs, tens of thousands of dead blogs, uh, things like that. So I was one of the few out there that was kind of doing that. And um, I was just fortunate that I had a, a large readership that grew. Uh, I wasn't making, I was making the most basic attempts at um, doing the um, the coding, you know, the, so that search engines could find it. And, uh, and through that, fortunately, uh, my very first assignment came from an editor that was a desperate editor that was Googling. She needed uh, someone real fast to write a, um, just a profile on Lisbon. And uh, she found my little Lisbon journal that was probably like 10,000 words long. And she said, if you could shorten that a bit, uh, she wanted 800 <laughs> words um, and, you know, add a few things, you know, to, you know, to fit their guidelines uh, and we'll give you some money. I was like, yes, this is exactly what I was hoping would happen. So that part went according to plan. Uh, so, yeah, it was a desperate editor Googling. That was my first real big time travel related article. I had written an article previously uh, for a local um, weekly, uh, which is now defunct, about a group of Minnesotans, uh, Minnesota unicyclists that were doing a road trip through Norway. Yes. So um, I was familiar Random. with the folks. I come from the juggling world. The juggling world and the unicycling world are, are married, like more this. or less. And um, in Minneapolis, in particular, the juggling and unicycling communities are very robust. So I knew these folks and I was in Norway at the time and they were just like inching their way up to the Arctic Circle on their unicycles. And I was <laughs> I just flew up there and met them. And I, you know, I talked and I got pictures and all that. And I, I wrote the story and I pitched it. And of course, you know, the local angle, it was perfect. So I, I, I by accident, got it exactly right. And a local weekly, that was my very first article. But the, the Lisbon one that went into a magazine called Global Traveler magazine was my first big travel outlets. That editor gave me more work, but as my work started to appear, you know, it's just like, you know, the snowball effect of any resume building experience. It's just people learn more about me. Uh, for some reason, more and more people were funding my blog, even though I was making no effort to market it. Um, and again, I think it was because uh, I was one of the few people out there. There was only a handful. But yeah, it was just, I think uh, it was excellent timing. It was a, a different era where you could, it was more easy to be discovered. And uh, I just accidentally timed it perfectly. That was the, maybe the only time in my life where my timing was uh, excellent. You actually ended up leaving uh, an enviable career in order to start your travel career or your traveling, your nomadic travels and your travel writing. Uh, and, uh, but then you also ended up giving it all up. Uh, and returning to normal life. And mm -hmm. one of the concerns that many of my readers have is, well, what if I quit my job to travel the world and then I can't come back and get a good job again? But, but you did do that. So what was your integration back into normal life after all these years of traveling? And how many years did you travel nomadically? Uh, I was on the road for four and a half years. And uh, by the end of that stage, I had a pretty established travel writing career. And uh, I was just getting tired of living in temporary spaces, having nothing, like I had no stuff, like privacy stuff that was mine that I could touch at the end of every day. But I just wanted to kind of ground myself again. So I came back to Minneapolis, my home city, um, uh, partly because all my family and friends are here, but also I discovered through four and a half years of travel that Minneapolis was a fantastic place to be, not just visit, but live. And, uh, you know, when you're nomadic like that, you kind of, my, my con what I had in my head was I'm going to find the most awesome place in the world and settle there when, uh, when the time comes. But uh, it turns out Minneapolis was pretty awesome. And I hadn't realized it was becoming awesome right under my nose, you know, in the 80s and the 90s. It was still a, a, a very white place full of white people with a lot of white snow and no, not didn't seem that attractive and um, little and it had always had strong theater and music, but th things like art, food, uh, everything had been developing under my nose without me realizing it. And, when, and it took me leaving for four and a half years to discover that Minneapolis is an amazing city. And so uh, settling back home wasn't that difficult as a result because I was home. Uh, I knew it was going to be affordable on my pitiable travel writing income. That was a big factor. 
And uh, yeah, so it was, it, I, I did suffer from reverse culture shock for like a year. Like every time I had to go to the store and decide on like, <clears throat> I remember this clearly. The first time I was sent to the store to buy bacon. And so I was like, I can do that. Um, I got this handled. So I go to bag and there's like 37 kinds of bacon. And you know, when you're in Europe and Southeast Asia and other places, you have like two choices of bacon or zero choices. And I was, I was overwhelmed by the the choices, you know, just the variety. And that was, you know, one of the earliest memories I have of, whoa, I don't, whoo, I'm not ready. I, this is not like, I'm from here. What is going on? And uh, <clears throat> the other one was uh, a TV monitor um, that showed ads that was directly in front of the men's urinal at a bar. So I'm, I'm, I'm this flashy <laughs> commercials playing two inches from my eyes. And uh, it was just extremely overwhelming. I had just returned from half a year or, or more than half a year in Eastern Europe where, you know, things were a little bit different. Romania, uh, where I lived, hadn't joined the European Union yet. They were still kind of struggling at the time. And just having this, you know, the commercialization of everything, including your um, relieving yourself, which sort of overwhelms me. Uh, and I, yeah, I struggled through that for almost a year before, I, you know, my stomach was tinier. You know how portions, you, maybe you don't, you're Canadian, <laughs> but in America, the portions are ridiculous. And yeah. so I, I could just eat and eat and eat because that's how the Pedersons do it. And um, coming back from... <clears throat> Eastern Europe and Southeast Asia, just, you know, the portions are smaller. And over the years, my stomach had just shrunk, I guess. I don't know. And so I couldn't finish a meal anymore. So it was stuff like that. It's just kind of dogged me for a year. And then, then it was fine. So it sounds to me like when you returned, you continued with your travel writing career. Uh, and then it, I guess it, but somewhere in there though, I remember you wrote an article on your blog called Killing Batteries, which is a great name, by the way, about the death of travel writing. And so Recently, somewhere, yes. somewhere in there, yeah, somewhere in there, you, you've developed some uh, different feelings about travel writing. What, tell me about that. It was part of the reasons why I ultimately exit travel writing. Um, after the 2008 financial uh, crisis, uh, there was a bit of a lag, but travel writing publications and outlets started to just disappear. Um, pu print publications, <clears throat> even websites. Um, some websites would shut down completely. Others would just not just like take themselves out of the business of original content. So I was losing clients pretty quickly, like good ones like MSN, you know, MSN, who you think would be just swimming in cash. They stopped um, hiring freelancers for any content. Um, that was a big blow. And at the same time that this was happening, uh, the influencer um, <clears throat> uh, phenomenon was really getting uh, some steam under it. And suddenly there was uh, a lot more people on the scene and a lot, and they were a lot hungrier than I was. You know, I had a pretty comfortable, you know, client list at the time. I wasn't having to really scramble. They were hungrier. They were doing a lot better with multimedia and all kinds of stuff. They were just presenting themselves better. And I found myself being left behind because I was just working, you know, I was just paying the bills um, with my regular clients until they started to disappear. And when I was back on the hunt for new clients, I was finding that there were fewer of them and they weren't paying as well. Other people that, that stuck it out, uh, their fees had been static for ages. And uh, I just got, I think it was 12 years that ultimately I was a freelance travel writer. After all that time, I thought to myself, I feel like I'm, I'm more my career is at a stage where it was like my second year instead of my 10th year or whatever, you know, I was, I was back to almost having to redevelop my whole resume. And uh, that thought was exhausting. And I generally was a little burnt out from the, the incessant hustle of freelancing. And yeah, so I switched to the dark side and I, I started doing travel marketing. And how was that transition? Better than I expected. Because uh, right out of the gate, I got a job at Mall of America, the most visited destination in the country. Uh, I learned to my horror after I got the job. <laughs> it was, you know. I, it really I mean, is the dark side now. It's, it's, it is. It's, it's, you're also, revealing your uh, <laughs> inner demons. <laughs> I, didn't have, I didn't have a concept of how big Mall, even though I'm from here, I was here when Mall opened. I went there the opening weekend. My girlfriend dragged me. And uh, so I was very familiar with it. I never went out there. There's no reason for locals to go out there because everything you need is much closer. And I was not sure how working for a place that wasn't necessarily in my 
area of expertise or interest uh, was going to work out. But to everyone's shock, especially myself, uh, I enjoyed it. Um, it was retail marketing, but it was also destination marketing of, of sorts. The Mall of America is a kind of anchor for Minnesota tourism. It gets people in the state and then the those folks, most of them, stay and do other stuff, right? So uh, it kind of rescued Minnesota tourism in a way. So I have to give them props for that. And I didn't realize the, the outsized role it played in promoting Minnesota. And um, so I, I ultimately took pride in that. I enjoyed the connection I still had with travel media and my former colleagues who were now pitching me. Um, you know, we went from being friends to them like, hey, um, what if I came to the mall and wrote about this? You know, suddenly the, <clears throat> the, the tide had turned. I wasn't pitching other people, people were pitching me. And so that, that was an adjustment period as well. And I did that for a couple of years and I did enjoy it, but the retail marketing ultimately was not a passion of mine. I knew it was never gonna be. And I wanted to sort of re, refocus on destination marketing. So I went solo. I went back to freelancing, uh, not realizing that freelance marketing was a lot like freelance writing and that the hustle is incessant and exhausting. <laughs> But you're still doing that today? No, not anymore. Um, <clears throat> again, the the hustle, the incessant hustle, much of which is unpaid, um, as you know, kind of got to me quickly. Less than I lasted less than two years uh, as a freelance uh, travel, tourism, marketing professional, and then I had, you know, I and I, I'm sure a lot of you you'll probably identify with this. I'd for years been struggling with the cognitive dissonance of how mass travel has been contributing to the climate crisis. And I had that in the back of my head at the same time, an opportunity arose for me to work in uh, solar. And so I, um, I thought, all right, this is my redemption. I am going to help, you know, I'm going to make up for all those flights to Hong Kong or whatever. <laughs> and, um, you know, Azerbaijan for five days <clears throat> and, and save the planet. So I did that for a year and a half, but the pandemic uh, squashed that because uh, you just couldn't do in-person work anymore. You have described a very, uh, a varied career. Uh, and this is actually something that I, I feel like in the gig economy, there's a lot of people who meander from one form of work to another and they they stay open to the possibilities that are out there and they're able to jump on new opportunities thusly. Uh, if you were to give some advice to someone, as I referred to earlier, right, a reader who's got a good job and a good career, but they also have a dream to travel the world long term and to to try new lifestyles. Do you have any advice for that person who is considering but nervous to quit their job and go down this road of travel as you have done yourself? Uh, I totally identify with that. <clears throat> when I did this in 2003, and there was fewer people to point at and go, hey, these people made it work. You know, it was just my family, coworkers, friends, they all thought I was insane. They thought I was throwing my life away. I was in my early 30s, which is kind of late to have a lifestyle epiphany and reboot. Everyone was worried about my health insurance, you know, because I'm an American, things like that. <clears throat> and um, that, that fear was mostly unfounded, because even though I never went back to the bank, there are, were at the time, tons of things that I could have done. I could have worked at a you know, private bank. I had a lot of skill sets that, that translated over from um, the Federal Reserve to like if I wanted to get a job at US Bank or whatever. Uh, and this is before travel writing seriously became an, an option. So I, I, I saw that as, you know, I could come back as long as I didn't spend myself down to zero. I was pretty sh confident and comfortable that I could come back with a you know small kind of emergency fund and spend you know three six whatever months job hunting and, and get a job fairly easily and um and and I still think that is true it just never became necessary for me so um the other epiphany I had at 33 is that life is very short it can end at any moment or be drastically changed at any moment and <clears throat> the whole concept of waiting to enjoy life uh, until retirement suddenly seemed ridiculous. Like you have no guarantee you're gonna make it to retirement, but also you're kind of old and the, you know, the adventures and the energy and the things that you have now, you're not necessarily gonna have. Some people do, probably not me, but some people can carry that energy uh, well into uh, their dotage. I knew that wasn't gonna be the case for me. I just thought I needed to get as much life packed into life as 
as necessary and, and as fast as early as possible, because you never do know. You know, I had a, a couple of friends die of cancer in their 20s. Um, there were other lifestyle uh, situations that sort of inspired me that uh, I needed to go and do what was going to make me happy immediately rather than planning to do what was going to make me happy 25 years down the road. This is yet another way that you and I uh, share uh, an experience in common because I, I did the same thing. I was turning 30 and uh, I had a successful career. I, I really actually in building my financial planning practice. I had put blood, sweat and tears into it. I just hit a tipping point where the practice was up. It was going. It was a well-oiled machine. All I had to do was just keep at it. And, you know, I'd be, I, I was, I was on easy street and instead I thought there's more to life. There's, I, I, I need, I have this, this niggling dream of traveling the world long-term and immersively. And uh, the longest vacation I took was a month and it still wasn't long enough for me to understand, you know, to crack the code of the countries that I was visiting and really to, to, to get in there. And, and I realized like you, I thought, wow, okay, so I can put another 20 plus years, 25 years, 30 years into this and I can retire and, and then satisfy my travel dreams, but there's, there's no guarantee I'll get there. Uh, or there's no guarantee that at that time I will be willing or even able to do the things that I really wanted to do, which was climbing mountains and volunteering and living around the world. So, so like you, I did throw it all in. You also dropped a financial nugget of wisdom, which I want to come back to and reiterate. And it was that you had an emergency fund. You had a stash of money that you knew would allow you to come back set up a place to live and hunt for a job for a while. So you, you didn't blow through everything. You had that kind of that limit whereby, okay, well, if I'm out of money, then it's time for me to go back and make something with this money. And that's really important. That's, I cannot emphasize enough how important that is from a financially responsible perspective, but also from a confidence perspective. I don't know about you, but I was confident hitting the road and traveling, knowing that I had a backup. And knowing that I wasn't throwing everything into this experience that, you know, may or may not have worked. Because when I started traveling full time, I didn't know how long I'd last. I thought maybe I just had some, to get something out of my system for six months. Who knew that it would last 12 years? I didn't set out with a plan like, OK, I'm going to stop when I have 10 grand left because that, you know, that'll get me through six months back home. Uh, and hopefully I should be able to find a job within six months. I don't know if I would think that now. I'm, I think uh, having... Uh, I was unemployed for seven months during the pandemic and it's just, it's been a difficult run. I'm not going to lie. It's been difficult because there are fewer jobs, fewer people are hiring. My skill sets aren't in demand as they once were. So if I was quitting my job now, I would be a lot more careful. I would be probably a little less confident that I could just parachute back home and find a job real quickly. I don't know if that would affect where I cut myself off for the savings that I needed for my emergency fund to come home and job search. But I think, yeah, that would have definitely affected it. But yeah, I, I had it an, an, a number vaguely in my mind. I don't remember what it was that when I hit this number, I have to come home. And the other thing I should mention is I didn't realize how far your money goes when you don't have the expenses of a house and a car and all that other stuff. I thought the money I had, which was substantial, um, would only last me maybe two years on the road at the most. <clears throat> and after the first year on the road, I had spent a fraction of that. And I was like, oh, this is going to go on a lot longer than I thought. And I had been living very frugally because that is how I am programmed. But it, it occurred to me that I could travel longer and do more stuff and maybe even treat myself a little bit better. It didn't have to be hostile dorm rooms every single night. Uh, so that, that realization that the money goes a lot farther than you think it will while you're traveling, uh, kind of, it, it definitely at the very least, um, made me realize that the, the nomadic wandering could go on a lot longer than I had originally planned. 
Absolutely. I had the same experience. I was very surprised to discover that my life full-time traveling life on the road was substantially less than it cost me to live in one place. And, and you and I are not alone in this, in this realization. Now, qualification there, it depends on how you travel. So, yes. uh, you know, you're inherently a frugal person, as am I. Uh, I was able to, my, my secret to having a very low cost of living was that I got free accommodation around the world. I was house sitting and volunteering and living on boats and doing home exchange, not um, hospitality exchanges and whatnot. And, uh, you know, so likewise, you had your own way of living frugally. Uh, you know, likewise, you could spend as much money as you want on the road. Uh, but that's the beauty of the travel lifestyle. You, you do get to set the terms and you get to determine what's important to you and how much money you want to spend on that. Uh, and I think most people do discover that they are fairly surprised that, uh, yeah, it costs a lot less to live on the road, when, yeah. especially if you don't have a mortgage and insurance and parking and gas and, and all the accoutrements of a yes. lifestyle. And also to buying stuff. Now that I have a home base, I buy stuff because I have a place to put it. <laughs> yeah. Well, I lived out of two bags for four and a half years. There was no acquiring of anything that wasn't, you know, absolutely necessary, like clothing. So <clears throat> that's it. I mean, on the road, when you live out of a bag, when everything you own fits into a bag, if you buy something, it has to replace something you already have. So you got to think really yeah. hard about what you're buying. Yeah. And the only time I was ever acquiring anything was, you know, about once a year, I'd find the time to go back home and, you know, reassure my family that I was <clears throat> eating right and things like that. So I would you know, to sort of like, cause I knew my parents were still a little worried and, um, you know, I just wanted to bring them something like here, here's this, this, this nice thing, um, that I got while traveling and it sort of worked, uh, late in life. My parents have become avid travelers, especially my father who was afraid to fly until, uh, he had no choice <clears throat> during a, um, a last minute funeral uh, in the early aughts. And then uh, when he survived that, he got bolder and uh, we eventually got him to Europe. So, and he's a cyclist. He's an amateur cyclist and racer for his whole life. He wanted to go and ride the roads of the Tour de France and, you know, the, the, the undulating hills of Italy. And so uh, that was a big motivator for him to get over his fear of flying. But yeah, so I, I think my little gifts and, and my, my, rudimentary travel blog sort of ease them into that. I, I can't say that my family objected to my decision to travel, although I will say that I was raised to be strong and independent, so they got what they paid for. Uh, <laughs> and That'll learn I, them. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> I'll show you. <laughs> um, I will say that all of these years later, my father admitted to me that uh, he, he was a little bit nervous about the decisions that I was making. Obviously, they were very unconventional at the time uh, and, and even today would be considered fairly in unconventional. But he gave me kudos. He said, but the, the, the things that you've experienced in these last 15 years, I mean, that's, you can't, you, you can't take stuff with you, but you amassed a, a wealth that will always be with you. And, uh, and it was really sweet to hear him say something like that, because that was a, certainly a shift in perspective. Uh, and to me, it was just validation that, that when you feel a strong calling to do something, you do it and you will find a way to make it work. And uh, if you're anything like me, the experience of just traveling is, is a never ending education. And it was <clears throat> I learned more about myself. I learned more about the world than I ever, I would not, I would be a very different person today if I hadn't done all that traveling. Now you can be found online. You have a, a variety of homes online. You obviously have your, your books, Backpacking with Dra Dracula and Throwing Up. What's the name of the ebook that you wrote about the television show? Oh, yes. We haven't even said that. <clears throat> so it's an ebook. It's a short read. It's maybe an hour and a half, two hours, depending on your reading speed. It's called The First Failed Travel Food Show. And again, it's an ebook version only because it's so short. Uh, but it, uh, as a result, it is also um, affordably priced at $1.99 American. Uh, and you can be and it can be found on Amazon. Uh, say what you will about Amazon. They have a publishing platform that is intuitive and easy to use. Uh, and uh, my book royalties, I've been fortunate that my books have a sort of an evergreen topic and the, the royalties are they're, they're not nothing. So is there anywhere else online you would like to direct people? Uh, especially uh, people hiring and travel and tourism, uh, please visit my site, lifepetterson.com. It is difficult to spell, I know, but just Google me, you, you'll find the right spelling. And uh, yeah, you mentioned Killing Batteries. That uh, is a very 
infrequently updated blog, but it has some, it has gone through, you know, it is, I started that blog in 2006. So it has gone through many iterations. And right now it's just kind of a place where I put stuff. Uh, before it was a travel <laughs> blog. Uh, it was, <clears throat> it was a lifestyle blog for a while. It was profitable. You know, I, I didn't get on the, the leading edge of that whole industry where your travel blog is your job, but I, I sort of caught up a little bit and it was profitable for a few years. I went through a period where I wanted my blog to be sort of the, um, you know, the travel version of, I don't know, Gawker or whatever. I wanted to be entertaining with, with news stories that were serious, but also funny and things like that. So it is, I mean, if you have several months of free time and you wanted to read the whole thing, you could just see the evolution of my life and the blog experiments, most of which failed that I did on the blog, but it has been that one like thing, that solid thing where I can put stuff uh, that I wrote that doesn't belong anywhere else. Um, so yeah, that's uh, it, depending on what year you look at the, the archive, it is a, it can be a very different blog from what it is today. Yeah, I will agree. When I look back on some of my early work, I, I <laughs> sometimes I'm impressed, which is nice. Sometimes I don't even recognize my own writing. Uh, yes. I, and, and oftentimes in the early days, I, I, it's cringeworthy. <laughs> but I yeah. do keep it up there, or some of it anyway, for yeah. posterity, because it is that snapshot of life. And it is that, that, that personal legacy, I guess, for lack of a better word. It isn't easy to find, but my old travel log that turned into a blog from 2003, before, when, I was, when it was the HTML version, that's still out there. Uh, and uh, the cringeworthiness of some of my thoughts and <clears throat> experiences uh, is, is equally not great. Also, my <laughs> spelling and my grammar, and it's just, there's a reason why it's hard to find, but it is out there. Uh, just if nothing else for me to refer to, um, should my hard drive ever explode. <clears throat> Excellent. Well, I will include links to your various websites and books uh, in the description so uh, people can find you because I will admit I did Google you and I discovered that you were a dead football player or hockey player or something. Yes. So you're actually not as easy to find online as you might think. I am, I am alive and well. <clears throat> that is, <laughs> it, I mean, this is, this is typical Pedersen luck. There's <clears throat> only one other Life Pedersen, I mean, there's a handful of Life Pedersons in the world, but there's uh, among them, the, among the five or six of them, one of them is also famous. I shouldn't say also famous, famouser than me, obviously, a famous Canadian footballer. And, uh, and yes, unfortunately, he passed away uh, a little young <clears throat> a few years back, and that has uh, messed with my Google search results as a result. <laughs> So if you Google life and you discover he's not alive anymore, rest assured he's alive and well, and uh, there will be a link in the description. Thank you so much for joining me today, Life. It's been a lot of fun. Thank you. Yep. My name is Nora Dunn. I'm otherwise known as the professional hobo, and I will catch you next time. <laughs>